Chapter 5 The Genealogy of the Children of Cain In the chapter on the children of Adam and Eve, it has been stated that the name of the character Cain in the myth has two very different aspects, one representing the lower or evil and the other the good or higher nature of man. Christian preachers of the day never refer to this higher aspect of Cain's character, and it is doubtful if the English-speaking clergy of today, especially in America, have ever looked up the etymology of the word Cain. To have done so would have brought them into contact with the Gaelic language, a familiarity with which would make it make at once apparent to them that the Bible was an Irish book originally, fictitiously represented as originating in a country geographically known as Syria or Judea. This would be more readily apparent if the student possessed the key to the ancient secret doctrine, which is hidden in the peculiar wording of the myth itself, as well as the astutely distorted and compound names of the characters enumerated in the genealogy of the children of Cain. I believe it is safe to say that the secret significance of these names has never been explained to any Christian congregation. The explanation is here given for the first time. In Genesis 4, 17, the text reads, And Cain knew his wife, and she conceived and bare Enoch. And he built a city and called the name of the city after the name of his son Enoch. In the myth, a wife signifies wisdom and the soul. In this myth, she signifies wisdom, as all the characters represent the good or higher aspects of Cain's, the spirit or ego, and the CA or body, nature, as exemplified through his descendants who are called his children. This wife, Wisdom, whom he married, embraced, possessed, that is, figuratively, made his own, brought forth a son, who he, whom he called Enoch. This name is simply a disguised form of the original Irish word Ienoch, pronounced Ainuk, meaning the sun man, signifying the solar body or the perfect man God. And he built a city and called the name of the city after the name of his son Enoch. This city which Cain built is the holy city or spiritual body which the name Enoch implies. And the figurative language of the myth of the human body is called a city. Thus we see the potential good qualities of Cain reflected in his offspring Enoch, the solar body. To set forth this esoteric truth and to embody it more fully, the myth is amplified to express the process for the development and birth of the solar sun. This is secretly set forth in the characters whom we may call here the grandchildren of Cain. In Genesis 4.18 we read, And unto Enoch was born Irad, and Irad begat Mehulel, and Mehuliel begat Methuselel, and Methuselel begat Lamech. These sons of Enoch are all Irish names, and to the instructed they conveyed their message very clearly. Irad is a compound word of two syllables, ir meaning the end or east, and rod, purposely spelled rad for camouflage, meaning a road, a way, a path, a passage, a gem. We learn from the character Irad that he is, in the myth, as befits a son of Enoch, a spiritual aspirant or wayfaring man travelling eastward towards the light, that is, he is engaged in the perfecting work of building the solar body. Irad beget Mehuliel, this latter word is a compound of two syllables. The first, slightly misspelled, should be Martha or Mathu, pronounced Mahu, meaning the good. The second, Hyel, 
is a distortion of the word lal, meaning light, a shoe, a latchet, a thong. This character covertly suggests that he is also, as we might expect him to be, a wayfaring man who wears his shoes, things that travelers wear on the foot in their journeyings. He is the good man who is figuratively traveling eastward in search of light, that he is striving for spiritual perfection. Mehuliel beget Methuselah. These two characters are the same in the first syllable of their names, though they are purposely spelt in a slightly different manner. The latter has the ending seal, which suggests the same significant secret idea and meaning. This is merely, this, there is merely this difference in the two names. The last one has instead of the ending Jael, a shoe, the ending Sael, a heel, implying a foot, in which the myth signifies a traveller or spiritual wayfaring man. This is the ideal figure used secretly in the Irish myth to denote the spiritually aspiring man. It can be easily understood by referring to Genesis 10, 6, where we read that Cush, the foot, from the Irish word Cos, the foot, was born to harm. It will be noted also that the revisers on their own account duplicated the son for Ham and called him Foot, with a PH, Foot. This is an interpolation so transparent that it is only necessary to mention it to have it recognized. It is absurd to think, even in a myth, that there could be in a family of four sons, two of the same given name, such as two Isaacs or two Josephs, and much less two Foots. So, from the original Irish myth mythical character Cos, presented to us as Cush in the text, we have an extra son of the same name presented to us with the fabricated name Foot. It will become obvious to the reader that the term wayfaring man is an idiomatic form taken from the original Gaelic and used in the translation to express the idea of the spiritual aspirant who is consciously striving to unite with his own higher self. This is the union which bringeth calm and happiness and the peace that path, passeth understanding. It is in connection with the perfection and accomplishment of this task that we apply the words of Isaiah, the prophet of Iessa, the Irish prophet of the sun god, when he speaks of the calm and peace, the change and the joy which come to the aspirant when the work is accomplished. In Isaiah 30. I will quote briefly a few excerpts from this chapter to make, this, make clear this idea and also use in the myth of the term wayfaring man. In the first verse, the text reads, the wilderness and the solitary place shall be glad for them, and the desert shall rejoice and blossom as the rose. Fifth verse, then the eyes of the blind shall be opened and the ears of the deaf shall be unstopped. Sixth verse, then shall the lame man leap as a heart and the tongue of the dumb sing for in the wilderness shall waters break out and streams in the desert. Eighth verse. And a highway shall be there, and a way, and it shall be called the way of holiness. The unclean shall not pass over it, but it shall be for those, the wayfaring men, through fools, or though fools shall not err therein. Tenth verse. And the ransomed of the Lord shall return and come to Zion with songs and everlasting joy upon their heads. They shall obtain joy and gladness and sorrows and sighing shall flee away. Thus we see the ancient Irish idea and idiom preserved and as it most fittingly happens, set forth in beautiful imagery and metaphor in the book of Isaiah. 
<clears throat> I shall digress here from my subject, the, the children of Cain, to explain the name of Zion, which occurs in the last verse quoted from Isaiah. The word Zion in this verse is a so-called Hebrew word signifying heaven. Historically speaking, outside of fiction, there was never a Hebrew language that is a naturally developed language called the Hebrew. The so-called Hebrew language is an ancient artificial ecclesial dialect constructed from the Irish language by the Irish Hebrew or Druid, priests of the fire or sun worship. In the original Irish name, Hebrew is Ebrach from Iod, pronounced Ea, fire, priests of the fire, and this name has been translated into English as Hebrew and given a false setting as to its origin and location. This order of priesthood in ancient Aire constructed this language for their own exclusive use for sac sacerdotal and ritualistic purposes. It was never originally or anciently the spoken language of any race or people. See chapter of Irish and Hebrew and Irish wisdom preserved in Bible and pyramids by this author. It was a sacerdotal language understood only by the initiate priests of the sun worship and served them in a manner such as Latin does the priests of the Roman church of today. When the church of Rome suppressed and absorbed the Irish church, the ancient priestly sacerdotal dialect formed by altering Irish words and giving them a stated meaning was taken over by the Roman church and presented to the world since then as the language of a branch of the Aramaic race, the miscalled Jews of today. The word Zion is a distorted form of the Irish word Sion, meaning heaven. Another form of the word Skind, a name which the Irish missionaries of the sun worship in their great trek around the world gave to a river in India, which name it bears to this day. As the as the Irish is the most ancient cultural language in existence, it can plainly be seen from its correspondence where the so-called Hebrew came from. The proof is evident in this fact that Sion was the ancient name of the river Shannon in Ireland. It was called Sion, the heavenly river, because it was called the Bride of the Sun and dedicated to him. In the same manner, we get Mary from the Irish Moor, the sea, and Moor Eog, or Midwarden Moor, the Virgin Mary, who is called the sun, the mother of the sun. As Ireland is the original home of the Christian sun worship and the undeniable parent of our modern Christianity, the similarity of words and ideas are easily accounted for, more especially when we know that Judaism from Yud, Yud, the day and bright aspect of the sun, originated and flourished in Ireland and is but another name for the sun worship. We saw by the quotations of the text from the 35th chapter of the book of Isaiah, the reflection of the original Irish scripture and the natural constructive in inference to be gleaned from the characters of Mehulio and Methuselah. One is the good shoe, the other is the good heel. In the myth, both of these characters are exemplars of the good work and travelling on the spiritual path or way, which culminates in the travellers arriving at his long sought destination and becoming united with his solar body. This will be, be further seen in the explanation of the name of the son of Methuselah, Lamech. In the text Genesis 4.19 it reads, And Lamech took unto him two wives. The name of one was Adar and the other Zillah. The term Lamech is a true Irish etymon and means having hands and is applied to one who is skillful with his hands. It is an idiomatic Irish expression and is used in the myth to signify the successful and skillful artist and craftsman, the builder, 
who was engaged in the arduous, delicate and selective work of erecting the splendid palace or spiritual body, which is to be the ultimate vesture of the ego or self. In early ages and up to the time immediately preceding the Anglo-Norman invasion of the island and the absorption of the Irish church and in institutions by Rome, the patriarchal system, which originated in Ireland and is reflected in the Irish scripture of myths of our Bible, still existed. It had become merged and identified with the great monastic establishments of the country. The leaders of those powerful establishments or religious orders sometimes became kings, and their descendants were the nobles. The motto on the banners of one of those princely families was a spiritual one and a most suggestive one. It was the Lam Dairg, pronounced Lav Darg, meaning the Red Hand. It was the insignia of the O'Neills of the House of Tyrone. To the vulgar or uninstructed of later times, it bore a different significance. To those, it was an emblem of battle and intrepidity in war. Its true origin and significance was that it was adopted by the spiritual sept or patriarchal tribe of the O'Neills as a secret symbol of the work or labor of the initiate who was engaged in building the red or rosy body of spiritual perfection. Who among my readers of this day has not heard the expression, the red rosy dawn, applied to an aspect of the morning sun in the heavens or of the ancient spiritual order of the rosy cross? It is to the building of this rosy cross that the red hand of Ulster applies. In ancient IRA, it was, in ancient IRA was developed and arose the first order of Rosicrucians. The Germanic and medieval order of Rosicrucians received their inspiration from the first parent order in IRA. The Germanic prince peoples received their culture and their religious institutions from the Irish. It was under the leadership of the latter in the great struggle between the Irish and Roman churches that the Germans overthrew the Roman Empire. The Germans belonged to the Irish church and those wars were mainly religious wars due to Roman jealousy, aggression and lust of power. In the text, we find that Lamech, the dexterous, adroit, skillful artist and spiritual craftsman, married two wives. These wives here signify wisdom. The first one is named Ada, which name is from the Irish word Ada, meaning victory. And the other wife is Zala, a distorted form of the Irish word Silla, to sow. Therefore, Salah is the sower of good seed, which signifies wisdom. We find that Lamech acquired in those two wives two degrees of wisdom, which enabled him figuratively with the work of his hands to gain the victory over his lower nature and build the bright palace of the spiritual body. In Genesis 4.20, it reads, And Ada bear Shabal, he was the father of such as dwell in tents, and of such as have cattle. This son Jabal, which Adar brought forth, is the same as Abel, who, bought, who was born to Mother Eve. He represents the same idea. The name is spelt Jabal to disguise it. It is a form of the Irish word Abal meaning a spark or coal of fire, signifying in the myth, the spirit, and indicating the process being made towards the spiritual state. There is no letter J in the Irish alphabet, and in the translations, the revisers have used the letter J as a substitute for the letters E and I in the original Irish names. They have also, for purposes of disguise, substituted the English letter Z for the letter S in the Irish names. 
This is seen in the so-called Hebrew words, where Zion is substituted for the Irish Sion, and Zala is used for Silla. So the Irish character Jabal is only a variant form of Ebal, a spark of fire signifying the spirit, and bears the very same message as Abel, who, it will be remembered, was a keeper of sheep. He is the father of all such as dwell in tents and have cattle. Therefore, he is a herdsman and shepherd, which fact also confirms his identification and proves as well the etymological derivation of the name as being the same as when he is presented to us in the form of Abel. The term tents is used in the myth to signify those who are seeking spiritual advancement. This figure is used because people who live in tents and possess cattle and sheep are forever shifting their tents and seeking new and better pastures for their herds and flocks. They are not static or settled, but are moving and traveling like the wayfaring man in the myth to advance their spiritual welfare. Of such was Jabal. And Genesis 4.21, his brother's name was Jubal. He was the father of all some as handle the harp and organ. This character name is pregnant with occult meaning to one who has an understanding of the law of the evolution of the soul and who has possession of the key to the Irish myth. Without a knowledge of the Irish language, it would be difficult to approach the true meaning of these names. With this knowledge of the Irish language, the student or investigator who is equipped with the key to the secret doctrine will be aided in his research by understanding the etymology of the names and will be helped in his efforts by their suggestiveness. That this is true is evidenced in the fact that this is the first time since the Bible was translated from the original Irish that the true key to these characters has been given to the world. Without the aid of a knowledge of the great mother language, the writer could also have been unable to solve the problem. From now on, I hope, the Bible will become an open book for those, for, for all who wish to knew the truth and will not remain, remain a closed book as here for two whose occult truth was accessible only to the age-long exclusive few. Although today the majority of the Christian clergy are ignorant of the meaning and significance of these names. In the original Irish, the character Jubal is spelled variously as Eubal, Eubael, and Hubhael, pronounced Yuvhal. It means time, exemption, release in entire sense of freedom, it means he man, manumits, that is, sets free from slavery. So Yubhail, or Jubal, as the revisers have named him, being a brother of Jabal, is the advanced spiritual man who has, through his own effort, become freed from the trammels of the earthly body and from the slavery of sin and the passions of the lower nature. Therefore, as his name implies, he has become exempt from the necessity of being born again into an earthly body of flesh. His period of earthly probations or incarnations is at an end. This will be further understood when the statement in the text is explained that he was the father of all such as handle the harp and the organ, hereby implying that he was a musician. It is only the advanced spiritual man who can be a musician in the sense here implied. The human body is the harp of God, and it is also called the lyre of Apollo. The body is likened unto a musical instrument because of the system of nerves or cords which run along the cerebral spinal column. These nerves connect with the ganglia or clusters of nerve centers in the body which are slumbering the latent spiritual potentialities. 
These clusters or nerve centers are energized into potency by the vibrations which are set in motion and conveyed along the nerves or cords, uniting the clusters. Vibrations caused by the emanations from the brain or mind of the aspirant. Hence, these nerves are likened to the chords or strings of a musical instrument. It is through the medium of these nerve centers, awakened one after another, that the ego or self of the aspirant can gain exemption or emancipation from the slavery of the round or circle of life and death and rebirth in the body. How necessary this rebirth in the body is to the average humanity and may be seen at once by reflecting upon how little progress is made by the individual man in the allotted space of one earthly lifetime. It becomes obvious that man must reincarnate many times before he becomes perfect. This profound truth was first discovered by the great master adepts of ancient Aire, and this is the secret reason why the harp was the symbol of the ancient Irish. When this fact is properly appreciated, it will be more readily understood what irony there is in secretly attributing to the misnamed race of so-called Hebrews or Jews of today, the symbol of the tiny Jew's harp. Either of these names is a misnomer and has been imposed upon this latter people only in a comparatively recent period of time. All of the extant so-called ancient history of the Jews, such as the antiquities of the Jews, supposedly to have been written by one Flavius Josephus, is fictitious. It is a pure invention and was written and compiled to sustain the fiction of the history of the so-called chosen people. The key to its refutation is within, and, is within itself and the fraud must be obvious to the one who has apprehended the truths disclosed in these pages. In the light of what has been set forth herein, it can be readily seen that the works of Josephus are but a palpable attempt to set up an alibi in regard to where we obtained our scriptures, to agree with Roman authority and to secularize and convert into bona fide history the mythical incidents of the biblical text. Neither the one nor the other is history. Those works were forged to furnish an historical background for the Bible. Josephus is an allegorical character, whom will, be, whom will be explained elsewhere. In Genesis 4.22, the text reads, And Zillah, she also bare to Bulkan, an instructor of every artificer in brass and iron. And the sister of Tubal-Khan was Nama. As has already been shown, Salah, like Adar, signifies wisdom, and like Adar, she bears good fruit to Lamech in the persons of these two children. These children signify two progressive steps forward in the process of building the permanent spiritual edifice of the solar body. The first of these figurative children of Salah is the sower, is Tubal Khan. The ward Tubal is a disguised form of the Irish word Tuathal, pronounced Tuhal, meaning a lord, signifying in this character the spiritual or advanced ego. Hence the character Tubal Khan signifies the spirit and the body, and it is the spirit which instructs. Another form of this word is Tupal, pronounced Tuval. To avoid the possibility of its identity being recognized, the revisers have omitted the qualifying letter H and made the word Tubal with the suffix Cain, the body. The word Cain, here in this name, associated with the spirit, Tubal, implies the good attributes of the word and denotes a spiritual man. He is thus presented to us in his capacity as the original artificer in metals, brass and iron. 
This is the figurative method of informing us in the myth that it is through the spirit that we are instructed and advanced from within. The brass and iron represent the things of the lower nature, the iron the very lowest and the brass a more refined metal, the qualities not so gross. The sister of Tubal Khan is Nama. This is also an Irish name and means the saintly or holy one and here signifies the soul. In the Irish language, the word saint or holy is written in two forms. One of these forms is Naob, with a dot over the B, making it Naob, pronounced Navha. The other form of, for either of these two words is Nam, the dot making it Namb, pronounced Nav. The dot over the letter M in this word gives it the value of the BH, which is equivalent to the English letter V, thus giving the word the sound of Nav. The revisers preserved this latter form, but disguised the word under the form of Nama which is very near to one form of euphonious spelling and in the original Irish with a dot over the letter M would be pronounced Navha, the, the saintly or holy one. Therefore, in the myth, this character is a worthy sister of Tubal Khan and she is identified with the immortal spirit or advanced ego. In Genesis 4.23 it reads, And Lamech said unto his wives, Ada and Zalah, Hear my voice, yea, wives of Lamech, hearken unto my speech, for I have slain a man to my wounding, and a young man to my hurt. We have here in this section of the myth an acknowledgement from Lamech to his two wives, who represent two degrees of wisdom personified, Ada victory and Zalah the sower, that to them he owed his progress in the purifying work of eliminating the evil qualities and tendencies from his nature. This he voices in the words, For I have slain a man to my wounding, and a young man to my hurt. The man whom he slain was his own lower nature, the gross sensual man. This is no light or easy task to perform, but an arduous and difficult one, fraught with suffering for the spirit's sake. Hence his wounding and the trials and sacrifices which he had undergone and made in, in me in the process of conquering his appetites, lusts and desires. That this is so covertly stated in the myth and is especially true in regard to the slaying of a young man to my hurt. To those with understanding, this is a plain statement of occult truth and is a verification of the ancient aphorism found in the text Proverbs 16.32. He, is, he, he that is slow to anger is better than the mighty, and he that ruleth his spirit, then he taketh a city. It has always been considered a most difficult work to accomplish, but not an impossible one for the resolute and persevering aspirant. Persevering aspirant. But it is so difficult that only the most valiant and persevering can accomplish it in the number of incarnations set forth in the myth. Therefore, among the ancient Egypt priesthood, anyone who had entered upon the path and strictly adhered to it through all the trials, was considered a noble and likened unto a warrior, a hero, a champion, and a conqueror. This idea is embodied in the names of the ideal personages of Irish myth and saga. Such are the characters of Cainarch, the Invincible, the courageous Oisin of Yem Bilke, Innocence and Purity, the beautiful son of Fionn, Oscar, the swift rushing hero, Hector, the valiant hero of great deeds, 
Uskar, the separator, ornament and jewel. And Fionn, the mighty warrior, champion and conqueror who inspired men to action. These are all names and attributes of this personified sun god. Their brothers and sisters and kindred and nomenclature have been pilfered and preserved by the revisers without acknowledgement and are the characters in our Bible. It is the ideal wisdom personified in these characters that the ancient celibate priesthood strove to emulate and they labored to that end. The difficulty of achieving the desired goal is further implied in the words of Lamech in Genesis 4.24, where he says, If Cain shall be avenged sevenfold, truly Lamech seventy and sevenfold. The distinction and inference made here is that the slaying of Cain, the grosser part of the lower nature, among the definitions of the word Cain is reproach, fault, blemish, is mere easily accomplished and therefore does not advance us to the same extent as overcoming and eliminating the more subtle and tenacious traits and tendencies of our earthly nature. This is what is meant by slaying a young man to my hurt. For at a certain stage, when we think we have succeeded, and eliminating completely these lower traits and tendencies, they raise their heads again. They take on the vigor and strength of youth and cling to us tenaciously. And until they are finally conquered, they reassert themselves again and again until after several lives or incarnations, they're completely eliminated. It is then that the spirit is free and exempt from the attraction or penalty of the lower nature and earth life. The term avenged in the, in the myth used in connection with the slaying of the young man signifies recompensed. The truth which is embodied in the myth just explained can be seen exemplified in the drama of life which is enacted daily before our eyes. In ordinary life we see human beings who have reached a stage where they abhor the grosser traits of the lower nature but are very weak in the application of even the comparatively easy test of living the golden rule. And likewise, the injunction, love thy neighbor as thyself, applied in a broad sense as it affects ordinary human intercourse, will in a measure serve to illustrate the difficult nature of the work. But the perfecting work is even much more difficult as it comprehends a complete transformation and involves the sacrifice of all earthly ties. Only the strong and persevering and righteous will and can accomplish it. Hence the ideal terms in the Irish myth and saga applied to the resolute and successful aspirant, the wayfaring man, as a warrior, hero and champion. It was such zeal and earnestness which enabled them to spread the gospel of the Christian sun worship to the ends of the earth. In this genealogy of the children of Cain, we find the summary of the number of lives or incarnations which have been held as necessary to accomplish the task of perfecting the spiritual work. In counting from Cain to Tubal Khan and Namaha, we have seven generations which covertly signify the traditional seven incarnations necessary to emancipate the ego or self from the earthly wheel. These seven lives are those which come to him who would hasten the process beyond the ordinary course of human evolution, immediately preceding the final victory. It is this continuous effort with respite or rest in the astral world between rebirths that finally enables the aspirant to accomplish the work of emancipating himself from the earthly life. This profound truth and esoteric wisdom is thus embodied in the Irish Bible myth of the genealogy of the children of Cain.